do see all of you here, and we're so excited to partner with the Transformation Worker Project to hear more about the work that you are doing. Um, my name is Annie Anderson. I'm the Manager of Research and Public Programming here at Eastern State. So I get to investigate and research the history of this building, people who lived and worked here, and transform that into exhibits and programs, and I get to book and work on cool events like this here at Eastern State. Um, so before I introduce our guests, I'd just like to give a brief overview of Eastern State's history and our programs. Um, how many of y'all, by show of hands, have been here before? Okay, so the majority. So welcome back, and for those of you who have never been here, welcome to Eastern State. Uh, we are seated in the center surveillance hub of the prison. Um, it was designed so that one person could stand in the very center and look down all of the cell blocks and kind of keep an eye on the functioning of the prison. Um, Eastern State was built on farmland, uh, and it was opened in 1829, about a mile north of downtown Philadelphia. It was the first prison to practice solitary confinement on a large scale, and also the first prison built on the idea of penitence. That if you isolated someone in a cell, taught them a trade, um, gave them a Bible, that they would reform and become penitent and leave a life of crime behind. There are its architecture inspired over 300. Uh, radial plant prisons around the world, including uh, one in Mexico City, National Penitentiary, one in London called Pentonville, another one in the UK, Manchester, called Forest Bank Prison. And um, if you play the game Sin City and you type in that you want to build a prison in your neighborhood, it will give you something that looks like this. It looks a lot like Eastern State Penitentiary. So it was both philosophically and also architecturally significant. We think that, uh, based on our research and our archives, that there were about 80,000 men, women, and children who were incarcerated here over the prison's 142-year history. Uh, by the early 1900s, the prison had transitioned from a solitary confinement model to a congregate model. Um, people were allowed, who were incarcerated here, were allowed to gather for work and worship and leisure and play. This is the prison's basketball team. And a group of guards gathered at the front gate. Uh, wardens even lived in the front administration building that you all walked through on your way in. And um, there were actually concerts and radio broadcasts in this very center surveillance hub. Something tells me these people were not here for yoga. I don't know. <laughs> even though it's like formally dressed yoga. Um, the prison so it was open from 1829 to 1970. It was closed and abandoned for about 20 years. And in 1994, Eastern State Historic Site opened for tours as a historic site and museum. And today we're open every day for tours. Uh, most of our visitors access the site via a self-guided audio tour, but we do have a robust lineup of uh, guided tours. We have a daily 2 p.m. public tour. We have a series of art installations on site, including this piece, it's a video installation by Michelle Hamilton, uh, looking at the lives of transgender prisoners incarcerated today. Uh, this is Bill Cromer's piece, he installed a cell from Camp X-Ray in Guantanamo Bay within an Eastern State cell. And this is uh, Jesse Crimes' piece. He was incarcerated in a federal prison and he made newspaper transfers using hair gel and copies of the New York Times onto prison-issued bed sheets. And he mailed out uh, piecemeal, sheet by sheet by sheet, and when he was released from prison, he put them all together and created this really beautiful, colorful collage within one of those cells here. Um, in recent years, more and more, we're talking to our visitors about contemporary issues, including the unprecedented growth of the U.S. prison population. And every visitor who comes to Eastern State, whether on a guided tour or self-guided tour, encounters what we call the Big Graph, which is a 16-foot tall, 3,500-pound infographic sculpture that traces the rate of incarceration from 1900 to 2010. And it also shows the racial disparities in our prison system and uh, international rates of incarceration. The U.S. is way at the top, um, overshadowing all other nations. And um, the big graph really shows that there's no historic precedent for the way that we incarcerate our citizens, nor is there an international counterpart. And it's really, it was built to spark dialogue. Um, we asked our visitors, how would you like to see the prison system change by 2020? Uh, we do have room to put a 2020 bar uh, onto that graph. A uh, companion exhibit that we opened in 2016 is called Prisons Today, Questions in the Age of Mass Incarceration. Um, and I think Kanani was an advisor of this exhibit, uh, one of our guests tonight. 
Um, it investigates the policies that drive mass incarceration, the communities impacted by prisons, and the consequences of a criminal conviction. And it's meant to humanize this issue to inspire empathy and dialogue. We ask our visitors, have you ever broken the law? And why are there so many Americans in prison? To get them reflecting on their own relationship to this criminal justice system. Um, so when we built some of this new contemporary corrections programming, we worried that it might seem too political, we might drive away our audiences or our board or our staff, um, but in fact the opposite has happened. We've actually grown uh, four times in the past 10 years and our attendance today, uh, our yearly attendance is about 270,000 visitors. So it's heart heartening to think that our visitors really want to be engaged in these issues and dialogue with us about um, the past and the present and making this building relevant today. So what's on the near horizon for Eastern State? We are working on something called the Projection Project for 20, 2019. Um, in September of 2019, we will be uh, projecting onto the front facade of the building a series of short animated films made by incarcerated artists and also people working in prisons today. Um, and again, it's, it will be a tool to spark dialogue to get our neighbors and our community involved and invested in dialoguing about criminal justice. We'll have a series of programs and dialogues with community partners across the street at the cafe, so stay tuned for more about that. And also, we are um, anticipating building a new visitor center with modern restrooms, yay! Um, the, kind of the great irony about Eastern State is that it has this really innovative plumbing system. When it opened, it had toilets before the White House had toilets. Um, but yet, as long as we've been on a historic site, we've made our visitors use porta potties and a restroom trailer. So um, we're really excited about modern, to modern toilets um, and also just a cool, dry, comfortable space for our visitors to get oriented <coughs> to the historic site. This uh, center, so the Amazon, is actually the biggest uh, real estate we have for hosting events like this. Um, so I'm going to transition to introducing our guests. Um, just a reminder, this uh, event tonight is part of our Searchlight series. It's a conversation and lecture series about contemporary criminal justice issues. It's the first Tuesday of every month. It's always 6 to 7 p.m. It's always free. There's always a reception to follow. If you've got a little survey card, if you wouldn't mind filling that out, we really do read your responses and make updates on this program based on your feedback. Um, you can also give us your email and sign up for this email, the Searchlight email. Uh, we have a diverse roster of speakers. We had the director of Philadelphia Ceasefire this spring, um, Kate Maloney, who works with Villanova's Greaterford program, offering colleges and degrees inside of SCI Greaterford. And next month, we're excited to welcome Alexandra Cox, who is visiting us from the UK. She's a professor at the University of Essex. She's going to talk about um, the implications of confinement for young people. So without Further ado, um, I'm really excited about our speakers tonight, and I think this partnership with Transformation Yoga Project increases our commitment to reconsider the role of prisons and dialogue about all facets of our criminal justice system. So without further ado, I'd like to welcome Colleen, Colleen D. Virgilius, D. Virgilius, Colleen D. Virgilius. Bree Murphy and campus songster who also goes by Donnie, and they're going to talk about the intersection of yoga and justice. So please join me in welcoming our guests. Good evening, everyone. Let me just reiterate, uh, Annie, and thank you all for being here on this evening with this unpredictable weather. Um, I know it's been so hot and now thunderstorms, so we are so grateful that you made the effort to come here, so thank you for your presence. We feel like this is an important conversation to have, so we appreciate your input, maybe some questions as we go along. My name is Colleen DeRogilis, and I work with the Transformation Yoga Project. Since the beginning, since the Transformation Yoga Project was just an idea, and our director, Mike Huggins, mine. And we are a Greater Philadelphia nonprofit, and we offer the tools of mindfulness, trauma sensitive yoga, and meditation to individuals who have been impacted by trauma. We have programs and recovery centers. We 
We have inpatient facility programs. We offer programs to adolescents in behavioral health. And then the, the big one that we're going to talk about today is our justice and reentry program. So we have been facilitating classes inside of correctional institutions for the past four years. Um, we started a program at Greaterford through Breeze Connections with the Inside Out uh, Prison Exchange Program. And that developed into some yoga classes, which then ultimately, with the cooperation of the DOC, developed into a 200-hour yoga teacher training program, the first of its kind in the state of Pennsylvania. So we were so honored and privileged that we had the opportunity to go inside and to offer a program that was based on philosophy of yoga, education, teaching techniques, intersection of justice and yoga, and to work with some of the finest people that I've ever met to create a program that was unique and profound. And it was the most amazing thing in my professional life that I've ever experienced. And part of that is because of the great people that were working behind the scenes, the individuals that signed up to be part of this program, and for several other people on the outside, we have two people who came in from the outside to also get certified along with the individuals participants from inside Greaterford. So Brianne Murphy is here and she is our Director of Justice and Reentry Services and she will talk a little bit about our mission and what it is that we would like to do going forward and to continue. And my great honor to sit here with my friend Donnie campus songster who was uh, a participant, change maker inside Greaterford for many years. We were so honored that he was part of our program and to sit here with you, he's been he, he's been released in December. He'll talk a little bit about his story, and I just want to again thank you all for your presence here. Great. So um, my role in tonight is really to just put a little bit of framework around what TYP is um, means when we talk about the intersection of yoga and justice. Um, so really, we're talking about a conscious relationship. And that conscious relationship begins with our relationship with ourselves in terms of feeling our own bodies and minds and also taking ownership of who we are in this world. Um, but also about conscious relationship and how we move that outward in the ways that we show up in our communities. Um, yoga has been problematic in its transition and you know, movement to America. It's been something that's been colonized, it's been capitalized, something that has been exclusive, um, very not inclusive, or also, <clears throat> you know, this thing that seems to be for a certain type of person. Um, and I think that as we hold those, hold those realities about how the practice has been communicated, um, we really have an opportunity to take that into consideration and expand the potential for who can be included in the practice in ways that it can be made <laughs> most accessible. Um, you know, if, if our practice can be defined by the physical practice, but it can also be much more expensive, and we can figure out different ways how this lifestyle can impact all of those around us. Um, so as we're moving into this conscious relationship, we're really talking about that same healing connection that happens for us as individuals being moved outward so that our impact is exponential. I mean, we were living in a critical time. I'm sure that everyone who lives in time is called them critical. But we are living in a critical time where this conscious relationship to those around us, um, it matters. And so figuring out ways that we can create community to support and uplift each other in the different roles that we play in those spaces. Um, so, you know, as a yoga and trauma-sensitive yoga-oriented organization, we're really talking about uplifting values of anti-racism, radical inclusion, um, liberatory language, but then also this revolutionary reclamation of well-being, right? Taking well-being into our own hands um, so that we can move within ourselves, but also move within the spaces that we have the capacity to affect others in a way that is healing, that is, takes into account justice. 
Um, so of course, you know, we do have programs that expand all the way, taking into the consideration from school to prison, um, and then into reentry. Because whether someone is incarcerated, whether someone is in a facility for mental health treatment, right? The, we don't ever end our being a part of our community, right? It's not like an, individuals who are incarcerated are no longer parts of our community. So if we're talking about envisioning a future where justice happens, it means not forgetting those who might not be in the same space as we are. Um, so, you know, it's been, as Colleen said, it's a great honor to be able to sit here with our friend Johnny. I mean, there are countless things that we have learned being able to sit in spaces with them, and I'm just excited to be able to have this conversation that is so, I think, near and dear to each of us. Um, to be able to really move into this space and recognition of how important it is to uphold whatever practice, right? So we're talking about yoga, but we're also really talking about the practices that we do that elevate us and energize us and restore us to be able to face whatever suffering exists in this world. Um, so we're not always look the same for all of us, but without further ado, I think I want to pass this over to Ghani so that we can start to talk about um, the experience with yoga teacher training as it happens on the inside. Thank you, thank you, um, Green Colleen. You know, one of the things that really got me thinking about um, how yoga could be a tool for social change and maybe how we maybe how we can even find the intersection between a yoga practice and criminal justice reform or or any kind of like mass upliftment or mass improvement was the more I thought about the ecological crisis that we're all facing. Something that is at all of our throats. Climate change and all of these things. And I wanted to know, I know that what it would take to avert something that was threatening to all our species would require more than just individual transformation. You know what I'm saying? Or an individual practice. And so that's what me and we got in this conversation about how do we make sure that yoga doesn't become some form of new spiritual individualism, you know, that just fits neatly into this culture of rugged individualism, but in this nice new age way. You dig what I'm saying? And so we wrestled with that. And I was thinking about, um, we started talking about conscious Buddhism, and not to go into something else, because yoga doesn't, doesn't necessarily mean Buddhism, but there was a concept in Buddhism that meant, um, what was the word, dukkha? I think it is it's spelled in the English um, phonetics of it is D-U-K-K-H-A, and it meant separateness. And how the Buddhists say that dukkha or separateness is the root of all, or the cause of all suffering. And, and so I thought about racism and how that is a form of separation. We know a long kind of contrived lines of racial identities. Poverty is about separation along economical status, like gender, and you know, even the ecological crisis is about human beings separating themselves from the rest of the planet and putting our needs first. You get what I'm saying? And so, how do we find the intersectionality or the marriage between yoga, which is supposed to be about union of the body and the mind, and make it something? How can we practice collective yoga? All right? And so, um, I, I, just, I just got so much out of that conversation. And when we and when you came and when we, when you were training us, when TYP came in and you were training us to become yoga instructors, I just want you to know that that is the spirit that I entered the practice with. You know, as I was holding those positions, as I was laying in Savasana, those were the things that I was meditating on. How do we, you know, find sameness with each other? 
sameness and how do we eliminate separation? That is the key because the, um, the problems that we face are largely because of divide and conquer. <laughs> you know what I mean? Not that you're not known for going on a tangent, but these are just some of the things that that I started wrestling with as we practiced together. You know, and it guided me, it guided me, it helped to help transform me and shape my politics and my philosophy. You know, yoga. So I hear you saying like, you know, it's shaped your politics and your philosophy. And I know that far before the time that we met each other, you were actively involved in the community, right? But I do think that there is a certain element of supportive nature that the practice can offer. So I'm just curious about, like, you know, knowing how involved you are in this idea and this fight or this struggle, whatever you want to call it, for justice. Um, what kind of support does the office of practice offer you, like, you know, in those firm or concrete or maybe not so firm and concrete ways? Well, first of all, there is no justice movement if we are not just with ourselves first. All right? So let's begin there. And I noticed that from just every regular person, every working class person, but especially people involved in the movement, so-called activists, is, you know, a lot of times, you know, we jump ship on ourselves. You know, we neglect self-care, right? And so you can't fight for justice if we don't know how to, you know, meet justice out to our own selves and our own bodies. These bodies that have been with us and carrying us and sustaining us from since before we could remember. So justice, the justice movement has to start with itself first. Right? And so that's how you support first by teaching us self-care. And now, but also with us on the inside, how you support us is by, by teaching us how to to center ourselves and ground ourselves more, you know, um, and how to form fellowships and how to become less competitive with each other. I think those things are so important to bring within the prison context. You know, I know guys that wouldn't perform yoga, wouldn't dare come in that space and roll out a yoga mat because they thought it was doing something sissy, right, within a prison context. They made fun of each other. I know guys that wouldn't do it because they thought that they were from a certain religion and they thought yoga was something religious and they wouldn't do it, right? But the way you presented it to us, you showed, you know, you showed us that yoga, okay, so you don't want to say namaste. You don't have to say namaste. You can say peace. You know, you can say, you know, peace be on you. You know, you, you, um, and, and it's not about you being as flexible as the other person. You know, enjoy your own body, find peace in your own limitations. You know, matter of fact, don't look at your limitations as limitations. All right? You know, and so they're just, um, they maybe just jump off points to something else. Right? And so, yeah, you supported us in that. You know, and for real, for real, if you want me, if you want, in the interest of full disclosure, you all came to my resentencing. The DYP, you came to me, supported me getting a second chance. You know, I wouldn't be sitting here if it wasn't for, you know, part of my mitigation pack was the fact that I was a trained and certified yoga instructor. And you gave me that. You gave me that. You know, and the judge took note of that. So that's very serious. You know, and I know guys on the inside now who had impulse control problems, who had anger issues, who were prone to reaction, reacting to certain situations in the wrong way. They don't do that now. Now they breathe. They breathe. You know, they take a moment to go in themselves and they settle themselves. 
They do sun salutations every morning. You know what I'm saying? This is unheard of. And there's no reason why it should only be out of, in, in, out of 31 prisons that something like this should only be in one or two prisons in the whole state. Yoga should be in, in every prison. In every prison. If a prison is really about rehabilitation. Connie, could you speak to the community that was built within the yoga teacher training program? How a group of individuals from different backgrounds, different situations, different belief systems came together, and what that process was like? Yeah, there was about, what, nine or ten of us in the training? And even though some of us, some of us knew each other, we might have known each other in passing because you know it's a prison and so at some point you, you won't pass a person on your way to chow, on your way to the yard, or the library, or the gym, or the commissary. But you may not have spoke, you know, or you may have just greeted, right, but just practicing with each other, whether it was two times a week, right, and then we had the retreat on Saturday, and sharing, you know, leadership, you know, um, in those in those roles, sometimes I would take my turn. Sometimes it would be not out. You know, we became brothers. We became a family. You know, and we no longer made fun of each other. You know, we didn't make fun of each other. We know John Brookins. He was a power lifter. He could deadlift seven hundred pounds off the floor, right? But we and I mean, he, everybody that knows John Brookins, you put your hand on his trapezius muscles and you can. You the energy. I mean, so it was no, but after a while, it was no longer funny seeing him standing in the tree pose or the eagle pose. It was like, you know, John, that's that's John becoming a whole person, right? And that's me becoming a whole person, recognizing his wholeness, right? And so we're a family, you know, we're a family. And everyone, almost just about everyone that did the training, now they're part of the Right to Redemption group, fighting for parole eligibility for people sentenced to life without parole or death by incarceration. And so yoga also, I don't know, I don't know how how they, you know, how it connected with their, you know, their, 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 the politics, but it sure did. Yeah, I had the opportunity to be able to like reflect on some of these questions about, um, you know, what is it that the practice can offer us, and how is it that we can keep coming back to it? And I think something that you're saying is really what I feel too is that it offers us an opportunity to like really be seen, and then also see people for like their highest capacity. And there's something that happens when you're entering into very oppressive systems and people are allowing you to see them for their best selves. Because that is the decision, and that is the gift that just gets offered to people, you know, who are coming in from the outside, you know, coming in from spaces that offer this practice that has a, a label or a preconceived notion around it about who it's for and what it is and what it can offer. And, you know, I can never fully articulate the impact of having as you're saying, like having this family. Like I have folks who I who have been transferred um, to different institutions and are starting to teach classes, but that connection like needs to be maintained, not just because you know we're working for this organization, but because we've made a commitment to justice that looks a particular way. And it doesn't matter where you go from here, it just matters that we're connected and being able to maintain that that support, you know. The same support that we would offer to you, anyone who enters into our circles as part of this family that's like, you know, this system, right? Because the family is just a system of relationships and you choose to make it how you make it, right? Um, so the system of the relationships that, that we've been, you know, given this like opportunity to hold really, I'm going to use the word sacred, but you can call it whatever you want, the sacred relationship where it's like, how do we uphold that to the highest standard and, and to really maintain seeing people who offer the you know unlimited capacity to see you too? 
Um, and I don't think that yoga is the only thing that can offer such a connection, but I think it's an important piece. You know, as we have folks who would choose to build a relationship in a yoga studio or a church fellowship or places, you know, here or there throughout the community, throughout the city, the same is going to happen on the inside, right? People who are drawn to church fellowship, who are drawn to recovery groups, who are drawn to yoga practice. And if that's an opportunity for someone to fully connect with themselves and with those around them, then the access needs to be there. Um, and hopefully, you know, it's not in one or two institutions. Hopefully it moves beyond and outward into many. The schools. You know, and this is another thing about yoga um, that I hope translates into the schools as early as in elementary and maybe even, maybe even preschool. You know, because as someone who was on the wrong side, I don't think there's a right side of violence, but we're not meant to hurt each other. And as someone who was on that side of violence, and at a young age, having been in prison since the age of 15 years old, sentenced to life without parole, serving 30 years until, until the U.S. Supreme Court ruled that children should be sentenced to life without parole or death by incarceration, right? Having been on the outside now for just six months, um, I'm, I'm looking at and, and listening to how people talk about children that commit heinous acts or well, the child knew right from wrong you know the child knew right from wrong and so the child know that they should steal or the child know that they shouldn't kill but, but i know that it's it's, it's 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 a little it's a little more it's a little more complex than that with children you know children may know right from wrong of course you tell your child don't steal you tell your child, don't do it. They know now because you've told them. But what the child lacks is the breaking mechanism, the ability to stop themselves from doing wrong. A lot of times, the ability to govern themselves is not fully developed. And so, what you have is a lack of impulse control. The prefrontal lobe is just not, the, the mechanism that's meant for impulse control is just not fully developed until a certain age. And so I, I think that what we, or what we also need in schools is more impulse control programs. And yoga can play a big part in that. You know, we have gyms to help children develop their bodies. We need something to help them develop their brains to their ability to control their impulses. Aristotle said 2,500 years ago in, in his treatise on rhetoric, he said what? In terms of their character, the young are prone to desires and inclined to do whatever they desire. And they are impulsive and quick tempered. And they are impulsive and quick tempered and inclined to follow up their anger by action. And they are unable, and they are unable to resist their impulses. For through love of honor, they cannot put up with being belittled, but become indignant if they think they are done or wrong. And though they love honor, they love victory more for youth longs for superiority. And victory is a kind of superiority. And they are filled with good hopes because like those drinking wine, the young are heated by the nature. The young are heated by their nature. And they are filled with good hopes because of not yet having experienced much failure. And so this we knew this 2,500 years ago that children have impulse control problems. And so I advocate for yoga, mindfulness, and other impulse control programs and initiatives not just in the prisons, but in the schools. It's not enough to tell a child right from wrong, but help them to strengthen that mechanism to stop themselves from doing wrong. Right? We changed our agenda slightly due to the weather. So we have some more time for discussion. We'd like to incorporate some centering, some movement, and a meditation. Um, but I'd like to open it up for a few minutes if anybody has any questions that you'd like to ask any of us here.
Any questions about the programs that we offer currently? Any questions specifically for Kempis and his experience? Can you speak a little bit about the programs you currently offer throughout the Department of Corrections, which facilities you're in, and how many people are enrolled, and how many graduates you have graduated? Awesome. I was gracious. I was like, oh, that's a question for me. Um, <laughs> so, yeah, we have um, programs in the greater Philadelphia area all the way from school to prison to reentry. Um, so, we have several school programs that are targeted in areas that have a higher rate for youth who are getting sent to juvenile detention. Um, we're hoping to like build up that up. Um, but we also have programs throughout three youth centers. Um, one in Philadelphia, Delaware County, Montgomery County. Um, and then we also have county level programs, Philly Department of Prisons, um, Montgomery County Correctional, Ch Chester County Correctional, and other institutions. As far as our DOC programs, that's really where we look at doing yoga teacher training um, because of the length of time that we have and access to individuals. Um, so, we just graduated an inside out teacher training um, at SCI Chester, where we had 13 graduates. Sam is one of our graduates in Hudson. <laughs> Good. So we had 13 graduates, and then we were um, had nine folks from the inside of the institution who are applying to actually teach and get paid for their time of instruction through, um, it's called inmate employment. Um, so there's nine from SEI Chester, we graduated nine individuals from SEI Greaterford who are now actively teaching about the institution, so like in spaces for folks who are categorized with severe mental illness, um, spaces where folks might be, um, you know, have stronger physical uh, restraints or limitations about the space that they can move. Um, and they've also applied to be able to teach in hospice. They were talking about applying for the RHU and death row and different spaces that, um, as far as like organizations on the outside going to teaching, we don't have as much flexibility to be able to meet all the needs for the different units. Um, so nine graduates from there. We have another class that's growing with 11 participants at SEI Greaterford. Um, so we'll be starting a teacher training after the move to SEI Phoenix. Um, we also did a peer-to-peer -peer training with 21 uh, individuals from SEI Monsi, which is the women's correctional institution in the state, um, so everybody gets processed through there. And four individuals were staff members, and then the other 17 were people who are incarcerated there. Um, so I can't do math on the fly, but I want to say that's like 35 individuals within the state. Um, and there's also been, uh, because of the move to SEI Phoenix, there have been folks who have been transferred across the state who are actively teaching their institutions. Um, we just got a letter from somebody who had 27 participants up in SEI Mercer. Um, so, you know, we try, again, trying to maintain that connection and that support for individuals wherever they go throughout the state. Um, so hopefully we'll get more stuff throughout the DOC because access to training is the best thing that we can do for folks, um, in my opinion. Uh, my name is Anna, and I'm privileged to work with TYP. I teach yoga in DC, in the state road. So every time I start teaching, I am in a circle. I ask each man, uh, tell me two things about you, how you feel. And that's if you want to do it, we pass. And then it's a silence. I say, well, you could say something like, maybe you feel sad or depressed. I go to, I go to the negative. But they never do. So I'm always interested in that. They, always, they often say things like, I feel motivated, I feel positive, I feel hopeful. I mean, it's every time it's some shivers. But I mean, I don't in all the year and a half I've been teaching, nobody's ever said I feel despondent. Any comments? Help me out with it. I don't know why. I, I don't. I don't. And I've, I know it's the same thing. You know, I think that's something that we really discuss about yoga is is the hope, this this attitude and spirit of hope that we draw from. 
you know, I don't know if it's maybe it's because it it gives us this increased confidence in ourselves. You know, I know for me, one of the challenges I faced was with insecurity as a child. You know, finding myself on the downside of courage in a lot of, you know, situations that call for courage. You know, it may have been dealing with bullies and so on and so forth. You know, because I was a real unassuming, you know, young person. You know, it's picked on a lot. You know, and so I always found myself wanting to prove myself and overcompensate. And that kind of attitude that led me into a lot of situations. And but ultimately led me into prison. You know, and it's with learning yoga that you know that I realized that I, I, I didn't have to I didn't have to prove anything. You know, I didn't have to show sure, it increased my sensitivity and my keenness about life, my appreciation for life, and then and with that my sensitivity with the cosmic implications of what I had done as well, right? Leaving a tear in the fabric of life, a hole in the cosmos, right? But also, but also it, 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 let me, it made me feel that there is a possibility for transformation. You know what I mean? Especially when I, at the beginning, I may not have been able to to hold a certain position, but for so long. But a month later, I'm able to hold it longer. You know what I'm saying? And with breathing, I'm able to focus and set. So, right? And I'm noticing it in other people around me. And I want to be supportive of the person next to me and not judge them. And I, I don't care. Judge and other people are not judging me in that room. And that's how that that experience was like in that space when we were being trained. And so every day it was something to look forward to. And so if you were to ask me, Brio Colleen, that every day how did I feel? I would answer, I feel good, you know, I'm in good spirits. You know what I mean? I feel like this moment is more pregnant with possibility than ever for me and for all of us. You know, and so, yeah, I mean, that's just for me. I don't know, I guess each individual would have their own answer. I, I, I definitely identify with that, definitely do. Yeah, and I think that there's this piece of it that is also about, um, like, our, our resilience, right, as human beings, um, to be able to enter into, or not even enter into, but be, born into or live through oppressive experiences and then to be able to find that capacity within um, to be hopeful, you know, to find purpose. And, you know, it's one of those things where it's kind of like a black box, right? Something comes in and something comes out. We know that there's that, that thing that comes out is like this, this feeling or this sense and now there's, you know, Science and research that's unpacking the black box and making it a little bit smaller. Um, there's this piece of it that's like, it's like this is magic, right? Something's happening here. But I think that for me, it's more about the power that happens or the potential that happens when people truly come together and are willing to see each other um, and to see each other for their highest capacity and their true sense of power and innate nature for worth for value, um, that inherent space within each of us that, you know, is integral to the fabric of life, that piece that means that it matters that you're here. And I think when we can come together with that understanding, then we have an opportunity to live in this feeling of, like, if it matters that I'm here, then I must matter. And like, that's a whole different story than what I've been telling myself, right? Um, so that being able to answer that question and be like, I'm good. <laughs> because like, yeah, I'm here and I see you and you see me, like I am good. There's not really another option, you know? I think that's beautiful, so. <coughs> I'm sorry, I'm sorry. Hi, hi, Gabby. Yeah. Uh, a guy and I went through uh, yoga 
were joining together, and Gregor Grad was one of the outside men that came in. Uh, but I, I just want to respond to your question, um, to get my perspective to, to that question. Uh, some of the, uh, I've been teaching at work for four years, and um, and went through the training process with them to become a certified yoga teacher. And on a few occasions, I led a meditation where I took the men through their feelings, asked them to search their body for fear, for anger, for sadness, for shame, and joy. And to ask that question, those questions, and ask them to feel those in an environment that doesn't feel safe. And it won't feel safe until a community is created. Um, so it took a while for there to be enough safety or sacredness to answer that question. And so it's been my observation that uh, there, there's a saying in, in a men's work, which I've been involved in, where power meets power, there's conflict. Where power meets vulnerability, there's domination. And where vulnerability meets vulnerability, there's intimacy. And only intimacy leads to transformation. And that takes time. And yoga, for me, has been a path to that intimacy and transformation. Um, and just a, a month ago, uh, we uh, had a session at Craterford that I was invited to, to cover for Colleen and Brienne who uh, couldn't be there. Uh, and it's sort of a pre-yoga uh, teacher training class. And I was just there today teaching that class again. But a month ago, we sat in a circle, about 13 of us, and uh, we were discussing the uh, yamas and niyamas. And I'll tell you, we came to that intimacy. Uh, now, a lot of the men I've known for four years, some were new, but we got through that discussion, we had an incredible discussion about all of the yamas and the yamas, and people were asking, well, what's your experience of bliss? What does bliss mean to you? And for men to sit in circle and have that discussion is awesome. I was just felt so privileged to have experienced that in my lifetime. And um, to help that grow, to help uh, get past the conflict. The world is so full of egocentric conflict. And yoga is certainly a, one way to try to transcend all that. So that's just one man's perspective. On, on that. And that's, it's a great question. Thank you for sharing. We have about six minutes left, so I think I would encourage uh, Colleen if you want to lead us in chair yoga and guided meditation.